All right, so our theme verse for this weekend, just got our theme verse right, is Joshua 1 9. So let's just cut right to the chase. Let's go straight to Joshua 1 9. We'll read it here. Start off. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 9 reads, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. This is encouragement I see in this verse. This is uh, encouragement to a man, Joshua, who is about to take over a leadership role. Um, in this verse, Moses has just passed away at the very beginning of this book. Let's go ahead and start from Joshua chapter 1. Excuse me, verse 1 of chapter 1. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, who is Moses' minister, saying, <clears throat> Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, which is the river Jordan, Thou and all this people unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given to you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God is reminding Joshua the promise that he gave to Moses. And he's reaffirming this promise to Joshua. So that Joshua could make this promise his own. And he gives him another promise in chapter verse 5 there. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. That's pretty amazing. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. This is applicable in our lives as well. God does not leave us. He does not fail us, nor does he forsake us. Verse 6 says, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. The book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. It's quite a couple times here that God is telling Joseph to be strong, and to, excuse me, I said Joseph, Joshua, to be strong and to be of a good courage. This is very important to God section here. He is encouraging Joshua to go and do the things that he needs to do and to do them with strength and with courage. These are not cold, hard commandments, but warm, loving encouragement towards Joshua. This is what God wants for his people. He wants them to be built up. He doesn't want them to be destroyed. He doesn't want them to get whipped into submission. He wants his children to succeed. And God gives encouragement so that we can find success. And we are going to see a lot of success in Joshua's life here as we read. You know, and I think for young people this is especially helpful. I mean, the world is tough enough as it is. Um, we need a lot of encouragement, no matter who you are, but especially for, for young adults trying to find their way in the world, trying to figure out where they fit in. Encouragement 
is extremely helpful. And you know, we can go to this scripture, we can get encouraged by a lot of things in here. Now, uh, Joshua is not a young adult, however, when this is written. He was about 80 years old. Um, but it just shows goes to show you that people need encouragement at all at all uh, junctions in their life. You know, this is the first we're gonna read here, but these are like the first couple months of his new job. You know, uh, Moses has died. Moses is one of the, the prominent figures of the Bible. I mean, he was the leader of the people for, for one, two, three, four books. Four whole books, Moses was the leader of the people. And now Joshua has to take over. What big shoes to fill? God needs encouragement. So if we, if we learn how to take encouragement out of the Word, out of the Bible, when we are young, it will pay off in the future. We will be able to go to these scriptures. We will be able to be built up by the Bible. This Bible's not going anywhere. You know, people will come and go in your life, but the Bible will always be here. God will always be here. We're going to fail, that's for sure. But we're also going to have success. If you stumble, if you fall, and you give up, that is failure. But if you fall and you keep going, you pick yourself up, and God is faithful to help us get back up and get back on the right track, that is success. To keep going, to never give up, that is success. And so the topics we're going to be learning about this weekend will be immensely foundational for our lives and for the rest of our lives going forward. So, so uh, at this at this point here, Joshua's about 80 years old, give or take. It doesn't. I don't think it says specifically, but um, but if we go back, I want to kind of re, uh, recap on what his life has been like so far. So he would have, because of his age, he would have been born into slavery in, in Egypt before the exodus of the Israelites. So he would have been born into slavery, which is crazy to think about. And, but he saw everyone get out. Um, under the leadership of Moses, he was part of the exodus from Egypt. He was able to make that trek out. He would have been a witness to all of the miracles God did during, during this period, which would have been parting of the Red Sea. There was a wall of fire that kept the armies of Egypt back when the Red Sea was being parted. There was a pillar of cloud that led them by day when they were wandering in the wilderness, and there was a pillar of fire by night. So there's a continuous feeding of the Israelites by manna just pops up in the morning to get fed. I mean, that's crazy. And then the Israelites got sick of eating miracles, so they wanted to eat quail, and God was merciful enough to grant that to them. And, and then there's water from a rock as well. You know, Moses hit a rock, and boom, water comes out. I mean, these are incredible things that Joshua has seen during his life. He was also one of the spies to survey the land of Canaan when Moses sent out the spies. So let's go to that real quick. Let's go to Numbers 13. and we're going to start in verse 16. So right before, right before this verse here, it lays out all of the all of the men that went to go be spies in the land of Canaan. And so at this time the land or the, the tribe of Israel had 12 um, different tribes. And so they selected one representative from each one of these tribes or families, as you want to call them. And so there are two guys, Joshua and Caleb, were two of the guys who went. So uh, we'll start in verse 17. And Moses sent them, the spies, to spy out the land of Canaan, and said unto them, Get you up this way southward, and go up unto the mountain, and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwell therein, whether they may be weak, strong, or weak, 
few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it be good or bad, and what cities they be that they dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds. And then he goes on. So let's skip down to uh, okay. Let's go to uh, 25. So the spies went out, and then they and they were there for 40 days, and they came back, and they returned from searching out the land after 40 days. Verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And so, you know, they brought back just huge grapes and all this just plentiful, plentiful stuff from this, from this land of Canaan. Verse 27, And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So these guys come back, and what are they, look, what are they talking about? Just all this negative stuff. You know, they're like, okay, so, yeah, we went, and they got this great stuff, but, you know, they've got these giant walled cities, uh, these dudes are everywhere, they're huge, they've got a lot of weapons, and, you know, this is like the first thing that they're saying to the, all the children of Israel, they're being very negative. And uh, in verse 30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we, will, we be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. Let's get down to verse 6 of chapter 14 here. Because I said Joshua was with Caleb, but we're going to read it from the Bible, right? Not just because Brian said it. Um, Verse 6, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh, how would you like that to be your dad's name, Jephunneh, <laughs> which were of them that searched the land. Oh, sorry, let me start over. <laughs> and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, they rent their clothes. They just ripped them right off. And they spake unto the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. But the con all the congregation made stone against them with stones, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. So Caleb and Joshua are pleading with these people, do not be afraid. God is with us. We are able to do this. But as I, I think we know the story, the people would not believe. Caleb and Joshua brought back a good report. The other ten spies brought back an evil report. Caleb and Joshua told the people they were able to take it, not because of their own might, but because of God's might. That despite the circumstances, God would fight for them and they would become the victors. Now, I think this is a very interesting section to me, um, because recently my eyes have been opened. You know, did, did Caleb and Joshua deny anything that the other spies said? And they said, these men are liars. This is an easy win for us. No. They saw the same things. They saw the walled cities. They saw the giant men. They saw the armies. But 
why did their conclusions, why were their conclusions different? It was their focus. Caleb and Joshua were focused on God. The other ten spies were focused on the problem. They were focused on the cities, the walls, the spears. This is an incredible lesson for us. We need, when we come up against incredible, incredibly different, difficult circumstances, we need to make sure that our focus is on God. We need to make sure that our focus is not on the problem. Um, something that I, I hear uh, a lot sometimes from people is, um, okay, let's say you get, let's say you get a bad report, right? You get bad news. Um, you know, what, what's you know the worst news you probably get? You've got cancer, right? Or someone you love has cancer. And what I hear um, people say sometimes is they they deny it. You know, they say this is just false evidence appearing real. If you've ever heard that phrase, um, they claim it doesn't exist. But you know, if you've got cancer, you've got cancer, right? It's a real problem. We have real problems. But what else is true? What is I like to call it the greater reality? God is on our side. God will prove us victorious. You know, these problems that we have are real. They are real problems. They are not in our head. They're not getting to our imagination. You know, the, the, the children of Israel had a real problem. They had to defeat these people. But God was with them. But the people didn't focus on God. They didn't focus on the problem. So we need, we need to focus on God. We need to accept that we have problems. We need to accept that we have needs. And we need to accept God's victory in our lives. Because God's going to work within us if we, if we believe in Him and we let Him work. So what happened after the bad report? The people sided with the negative spies. And because of their unbelief, they are cursed to wander the wilderness for 40 years. They got one year for every day that the spies were in the wilderness. So, the spies were out for 40 days. The children of Israel had wandered the wilderness for 40 years. They were not allowed to enter the promised land until every member of that unbelieving generation passed away. Except for Joshua and Caleb. They believed and they were able to go in to the promised land. I think that's really cool. And that sounds like pretty, it sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? That everyone that didn't believe had to, had to pass away before anyone would let in. Would be let in. But if they went into that place with unbelieving hearts, if they went in without believing God, they would have got smoked. They would have got taken out. So God had to protect them. They had to protect all the other people. And you know, the Christ line was in that group of people too. You know, God couldn't let that get snuffed out. So we had to protect those people. So all those, so it took 40 years for those people to pass away, and Moses was the last one of that generation that passed away. Um, and so once that happened, they were able to go into the promised land. Joshua became the new leader. So this starts Joshua's story. And so we'll try and fly through these really cool. But I, I really like, this is going to be a, you'll see, it's going to be a, uh, a rapid succession of success for Joshua. Because of his belief, because of the people's belief, they were able to go in and and do some cool stuff. So let's start in Joshua chapter 3 here. But you know, the reason Joshua was able to do these things is because he had a mission from God. Right? You guys ever, who's seen the Blues Brothers? Has anyone seen the Blues Brothers? Alright. Yeah. We're on a mission from God, right? We all have a mission from God. And once God makes it clear to us, He's going to encourage us, and we have some work to do. And so this is Joshua's work. 
So, the first thing they needed to do is they needed to cross over the River Jordan. So, I don't have a map, but basically the river was the boundary between the wilderness and the promised land, which they were going into, right? So, obviously, if you're going to go into a country, you have to cross the border. So, this is their border crossing. So, um, the thing is, right, at this point, the river is flooded. So, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a flooded river where it goes over the banks of the river. It's a mess. It's just crazy. The water goes everywhere. It's so treacherous. The currents are going crazy because the water's going really fast. It's not something you want to just try and cross, especially if you've got a bunch of people. You've got men, women, and children. Everyone's with you. It's kind of dangerous. But let's see what happens. We'll go to Joshua 3 and verse 14. So, um, the beginning of chapter 3, God gives Joshua some instruction about they have the Ark of the Covenant and they're bringing it across the river. And so, uh, and it came to pass, as soon as the soles of the feet of the priests that bear the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of Jordan, that the waters of Jordan shall be cut off from the waters that come down from above, and they shall stand upon a heap. So that's, that's the promise. You've got the priests carrying the ark, they're barefoot, and they're supposed to just walk out into the river. But as soon as they do, the river's going to stop. Verse 14, And it came to pass when the people removed from their tents to pass over Jordan, and the priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, and as they that bear the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bear the ark were dipped in the brim of the water, for Jordan overflowed all his banks at the time of the harvest, it's flooded, that the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap very far from the city Adam, that is beside Zeratan, and those that came down towards the sea of the plain, even the salt sea, failed and were cut off. And the people passed over right against Jericho. So, you know, if you have a river, right, and it's coming, they say, it says the, the water's from above, that means, you know, where the water flows in one direction, right? So the waters that are above is upstream. So the water's coming down, and boom, they stop. And then the rest of the river just, it dries up, right? Because there's no more water rushing down. So you've got basically an invisible barrier stopping that river so that the people can cross. And so verse 17, And the priests that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground until all the people were passed clean over Jordan. So you know, you've been out after it rains. The ground's not dry. You know, it's been wet, and this is a river, right? So it's been wet for, what, thousands of years. <laughs> the river stops, it's dry ground, and they cross. And I think this is really cool, because I think Joshua thought Moses was a pretty rad dude. And what did Moses do? Split the Red Sea. Split the Red Sea. And what does Joshua get to do? Stop the River Jordan. It's very similar, and I think this encouraged Joshua to go on and do what he needed to do. Alright, so, um, we're going to skip Jericho here, because I think we're all at least familiar. I'll go over it real quick, though. But, you know, Joshua gets instruction, right? They come up to Jericho. They had some spies go in, talk to Rahab. Um, Jericho's got some pretty big walls. You know, and these, these walls have got to be at least... I'm going to say 50 feet tall. You know, and they're stone. They're not easy to break down, right? And what do the Israelites have? To have? Do they have a battering ram? Do they have ways to break this wall down? They don't. So God says, here's what you're going to do. You're going to look like a damn fool, but here's what you're going to do, right? You get the Ark of the Covenant, and you go around the city. And you do it seven days in a row. Now on the seventh day, you go around it seven times, and you blow the trumpets, and boom, those walls are going to fall down. And they were faithful. No matter how 
silly they thought it might be. This is the word of God. You know, you do what God asks you to do. And they did it, and they won. And then they go in. <laughs> it's pretty brutal, too. They kill everyone. And they burn everything. But there's a win. There's a huge, huge win. Because this is not how you win a battle. You come in with a bigger army. You come in with some machines of war. And you beat the other person down. But they didn't have to do anything. The walls just fell. People were unprepared because you're not prepared for your walls to just crumble. And they, and they, and they took them. So they, they win at Jericho. And again, they win because they listen to God, right? Despite the beginning, they thought, we have to win this. But it's not true. God wins it for us. So then they go on to the next city, which is called Ai, A-I, and they go there, and they, they actually um, lose the first battle, but it was because uh, one of the uh, children of Israel uh, stole some gold from Jericho. The gold from Jericho was supposed to be for God, it was for his temple, and someone took it for himself. And so because of that, they, they lost the first battle, but then... Um, they won the second battle because they took care of the issue. And then they come to the third city, and these guys are like, hey, um, can we not fight? We'll join your side instead. We'll join your side. <laughs> and so this city is called Gibeon. And so they sign a peace treaty with Gibeon. And so now they've got allies. And you know how crazy is this? They're supposed to come in, and they're, they're the enemy, right? To everyone there, but on the third city, they get allies. That's really cool. But then these five Amorite kings, who uh, they had, they're the king of each city, right? And these guys are the Amorites, and they go, okay, this is not good. <laughs> We've got these crazy dudes coming in here, and they're just destroying cities one by one, and now they have Gibeon on their side, and Gibeon's really strong. They've got a lot of really good fighters. So why don't we sneak attack Gibeon? Yeah. We're going to just take them out before they can turn on us. Sounds like a pretty good strategy. So, let's read. I'm going to read out of the NIV for this one because it's... The Old Testament can get kind of wordy sometimes, and we're not, we're not used to that. So, um, I'm going to read Joshua 10 here. And if y'all... Um, well... I was going to say, if you have a phone or whatever, you can switch over to NIV. I don't know if you want to do that, but you can just, you can just listen if you want. Alright, so Joshua 10. <clears throat> now, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem. Let me back up here. So, <laughs> why is this other guy king of Jerusalem? <laughs> right? <laughs> So the, the children of Israel had left this land before. And then they went into Egypt, and then they got enslaved in Egypt, and so now they have to go back and take what was rightfully theirs. This is also partly why they had to um, kill and destroy everyone, because they had taken what was the children of Israel's, and they had to take it back by force. So this guy, Adoni Zedek, was not the rightful king of Jerusalem. This is the children of Israel's city. Now Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, heard that Joshua had taken Ai and totally destroyed it, destroyed it, doing to Ai and its king as he had done to Jericho and its king, and that the people of Gibeon had made a treaty of peace with Israel and were living near them. He and his people... Uh, he is Adoni Zedek. Adoni Zedek and his people were very much alarmed at this because Gibeon was an important city, like one of the royal cities. It was larger than I, and all of its men were good fighters. So Adoni Zedek, king of Jerusalem, appealed to Hoham, king of Hebron. I love some of these names. I, mean, I don't understand why people don't name their kids Hoham. It's just very masculine, you know. <laughs> Hoham, king of Hebron, Piram, king of Jarmuth, Jephiah, king of Lachish, and Debir, king of Eglon, yeah, or Jafar, yeah. 
And he said, Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Then the five kings of the Amorites, the kings of, the kings of Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmah, Blackish, and Eglon, they joined forces, and they moved up with all their troops and took up positions against Gibeon and attacked it. Can you imagine, too, like... <laughs> I can't even imagine these names. Yeah, I know. But Gibeon, they're like, okay, they're trying to, like, protect themselves by allying with Israel. And then because of that peace treaty, five kings come after you, like, the next day, almost. Like, Gibeon's not feeling good about itself right now. They thought they were safe. So what do they do? Verse 6. The Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp at Gilgal. That's where their headquarters was, Gilgal. Do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us, because all of the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua, he honors the peace treaty. He marches up from Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. And the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. That's a huge promise. Do not be afraid. We're going to take these guys out. Not because of your might, but because of my might. Right? So after an all-might march from Gilgal, these guys... <laughs> they were they were troopers, right? This, these army guys. They marched all night from Gilgal, and Joshua took them by surprise. Normally, you don't fight at night um, in, in these countries. I mean, it's you know it's hard enough to fight during the day. At night, you can't see anything, so they usually wouldn't fight at night. So, and he, so Joshua came all night, and in the morning they're like, "Ha, gotcha! You weren't expecting us, were you?" And so they took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel, who defeated them in a great victory at Gibeon. So these are five cities all together, and they got confused, and they got attacked right away, and, and it was a great victory. And so they're running away. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Horon, and cut them down all the way to Azetah, and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Horon to, to Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them from the sky. And this is hailstones here in the NIV, but have also seen like stones, like rubble. Like these guys are running away for their lives, and these rocks come out of nowhere and just slam them. And then they were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gideon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. These guys got whooped so bad, because God, so they got whooped, and then God made the sun stand still in the sky so that they could whoop on them some more <laughs> until they were utterly destroyed. This is more than a 12-hour whooping here. <laughs> As it is written in the book of Jashar, the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down about a full day. So the sky was stuck, this, excuse me, the sun was stuck in the sky for about a full day so that they could just totally wipe these guys out. And the Israelites were fighting this whole time. And there has never been a day like it before or since. A day when the Lord listened to a man. Surely the Lord was fighting for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. So, you know, it, it's hard enough to beat, like, one army versus two armies, right? The Israelites came and beat five armies with God's help. I mean, that is a huge and crazy victory. That never happens. And then the sun stands still in the middle of the sky to help them out. God is amazing.
Let's go to um, I'm going to start reading verse 29 then. So this is what happens after they after they defeat these uh, five kings. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what happens here in the middle. Uh, so the five kings themselves, uh, they ran and hid in a cave. And somebody's like, hey Joshua, there's five kings hiding in a cave over here. And they're like, okay, yeah, just roll a stone in front of the cave so they can't get out. And they do. So they're stuck in there. And then, um, <laughs> and then... And then afterwards, after they after they completely wipe off the rest of the armies, right? They roll the stone away, bring the five kings out, and then they just behead them. And they hang their bodies on stakes, on trees, and they let them sit there for a day, and then they take them down and they throw them in the cave and they roll the stone back up. That's what you get when you defy God. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be in, in that position. And it's not this it's and it's it's defying God and it's defying defying God's people. You know, you don't, people that go up against God's people, there's consequences. So, okay, so we'll go to uh, verse 29. Joshua ain't dumb. He beat five armies in one super long day. Super long day. What, what would that be, about 48 hours? 48 hour day? So he's got more to do. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Makeda to Libna and attacked it. The Lord also gave that city and its king into Israel's hand. The city and everyone in it Joshua put to the sword. He left no survivors there. And he did to its king as he had done to the king of Jericho. So he moved on to the next city. Makeda, boom, you done. Verse 31. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Libna to Lachish. He took up positions against it and attacked it. The Lord handed Lachish over to Israel. And Joshua took it on the second day. The, the city and everyone in it he put to the sword, just as he had done to Libna. Meanwhile, Horam, king of Gezer, had come up to help Lachish, but Joshua defeated him and his army until no survivors were left. So he takes out one city, moves on to the next city. God gives it up to them, they beat it. While they're, while they're beaten on the second city, this guy comes up and tries to get them from behind, they take out that guy too. You know, they try to sneak up on him. Smoke him. Then Joshua and all Israel with him moved on from Lachish to Eglon. They took up positions against it and attacked it. And they captured it that same day and put it to the sword and totally destroyed everyone in it just as they had done to Lachish. Then Joshua and all Israel with him went up from Hebron to Eglon to Hebron and attacked it. They took the city and put it to the sword, together with its king, its villages, and everyone in it. They left no survivors, just as at Eglon they totally destroyed it and everyone in it. Then Joshua and all Israel with him turned around and attacked Debir. They took the city, its king, and its villages and put them to the sword. Everyone in it they totally destroyed, they left no survivors. They did to Debir and its kings as they had done to Libna and its king and to Hebron. So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and all the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all the breed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Joshua subdued them from Kadesh Barnea to Gaza. Oh, it's Gaza, sorry. It looked like it was whited out in my Bible here. <laughs> Barnea to Gaza, Gaza, and from the whole region of Goshen to Gideon. All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign, because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. Then Joshua returned with all Israel to the camp at Gilgal. So this is, this is one itinerary. This is one trip. They didn't come back to headquarters to get refueled, to get more food, to rest. No, they just went and they, God gave them these cities. And they did what God commanded them to do. And you can see the success. It was like the next day. They defeat a city, and then they go on to the next city, and they defeat it in one day. And then they go on to the next city, and defeat it for one day. At this time, especially if you had walls, it would take weeks, months to defeat a city. God gave it to them in one day, every time. And we can see why. 
they did what God had commanded, and the Lord God of Israel was with them. That's important. We need to do what God commands us, and God will be with us. So, you know, it's pretty brutal, um, but it's important for us to take what we learn here and apply it to our lives, right? Romans 15.4 says the Old Testament is for our learning. You know, I don't think God wants us in this day and age to go out and just kill people who disagree with God, right? That's not, that's not our mission here in the age of grace. Things are a little bit different since Jesus Christ came, right? So, but we do have enemies, right? We have an adversary. We have Satan. He's our enemy now. People are not our enemies. Satan and his kingdom is our, are our enemies. And we have problems of all shapes and sizes. You know, we have financial problems. We have emotional problems. We have medical problems. We have all different kinds of problems. But what we need to take from this and what we need to understand is that we can have great success in our lives if we do what God commands us to do. And if we allow ourselves to be encouraged by verses from the Bible. And we're going to get success. We all want success, right? We all want to succeed in this life. We all want to be conquerors of our own lives, of our own problems. You know, there is no greater feeling than conquering our own problems. It's worthwhile. It makes us, it gives us a sense of uh, responsibility and competence and And there's nothing greater than, than overcoming the problems in our life. But we need God. We need God's help. And He is faithful to give it to us. And He is faithful to encourage us. So let's read Joshua 1 9 again to close here. Have, I, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. So, God bless you all. I hope that we can learn a lot this weekend and that we can be encouraged by what we are going to learn and, and learn from each other too, and not just from the Word, but by each other's examples. So, thanks for listening. Thank you.